Okay, so the session is being recorded. That way, anyone who's not able to join us today can watch the session afterward. Your cameras and microphones are disabled during the presentation. So if you have any questions, please do submit them using the Q&A function at the bottom. If you submit them through the Q&A function, it's just easier for us to manage the questions versus kind of searching through the chat function. <clears throat> if we're not able to get to all of your questions, or you have a question that we simply aren't able to answer, then I encourage you to reach out to our two presenters today and their contact information will be available at the end of the session. And if my internet fails us, then we'll just restart this session using the same Zoom link that we sent out earlier. And hopefully we can get that back up within 10 minutes. If we're not able to resolve the issue, then I can contact everyone and we'll make alternate plans. So just want to say thanks to all the folks who make the rec water program happen. I'm, I'm probably even missing people here, but a lot of people come together to coordinate the sampling and analysis. And so a big thanks to everyone on the screen here, especially the stewards and the operators and the PHIs who are out there collecting these samples for us. So we have two presenters today. They'll be sharing the presentation. We have Janine Laguerre. She's the Natural Recreational Water Coordinator with Alberta Health Services. She started her career as a health inspector working in both Southern and Central Alberta. And for the past 12 years, she's worked in the North Zone as a frontline public health inspector manager and now provincial coordinator. And then we have Sarah Klimchuk from the Alberta Lake Management Society. And she is the recreational water technician for this season. Sarah will be supporting the rec water program by collecting beach samples and coordinating sampling with operators. Sarah brings to us experience with microbiological anal analyses. And in 2021, Sarah ran environmental DNA samples using a qPCR machine as an intern with the Alberta Lake Management Society. And I'm now remembering that I didn't introduce myself. And my name's Brad. I'm the executive director at the Alberta Lake Management Society. And we're really happy to be partnering with Alberta Health and Alberta Health Services for the second year in a row now to support the recreational water monitoring program. So the first presenter is going to be Janine. So I'll invite Janine to um, share her screen with us. Sure. All right, and can you see that, Brad? Yeah, that looks really good. Perfect, good. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Brad, for that introduction, and welcome to everybody attending today. So today we're going to be focusing on uh, recreational water monitoring, and this presentation is really intended for anyone who is involved in or interested in collecting recreational water or beach samples. And so our presentation today includes a brief background focusing on the safe beach protocol, um, the testing parameters within the protocol and the water quality benchmarks. We'll talk a bit about health advisories and then Sarah will uh, provide a detailed overview of sampling protocols for cyanobacteria, which is also referred to as blue-green algae and enterococcus. And we'll finish up with a few resources. So this is a screenshot of the Alberta Safe Beach Protocol. And it's the basis of the Alberta Natural Recreational Water Monitoring Program. It's a non-regulatory protocol and it includes benchmarks for enterococcus and cyanobacteria. And those are based on human health criteria. It also contains a site assessment tool and a recreational water management plan uh, that can be used to identify and to assess hazards at beaches. So first of all, we'll focus on cyanobacteria and why it's a concern, why we focus on it. So cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, it's not really algae, it's a type of bacteria, 
Um, but these bacteria, they use energy from the sun for photosynthesis. And as you can see on the slide there, they come in a range of colors and sizes. And the really interesting thing about cyanobacteria is they can actually control, control their buoyancy. So that means they can move up and down in the water column to access the best levels of sunlight and nutrients for their growth. And they are naturally occurring in um, typically sort of slower moving water bodies. So we see it in lakes, ponds, and reservoirs around Alberta. Now, when cyanobacteria grow rapidly and multiply, they can result in a, a, an accumulation of the individual cells, which is called a bloom. And so these cyanobacterial blooms are more frequent and severe in nutrient rich waters because they like things like phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, they are more likely to occur in warm water, but still we can see them in winter or in cold water. Um, like this middle picture on your slide here, you can see this was taken uh, during sort of that ice off period and there was a bloom of cyanobacteria and uh, the cells are starting to decay, which resulted in this really lovely sort of pinky purple color. Um, they can appear in a variety of different ways. So on the far right, it almost looks like somebody poured paint into the water. Um, so that's pretty characteristic of a cyanobacteria bloom. Or on the far left, you can see it looks like grass clippings, like somebody emptied their uh, lawnmower bag into the water and it that's a, a type of cyanobacteria that looks like that as well. Um, it can also show up as, as globs or like a surface scum. And when they start to decay, these blooms can smell pretty terrible, like sort of an earthy, musty smell. And now the issue with these bloom forming cyanobacteria is that some of them can produce toxins. And these toxins get released from the cyanobacteria cells when they die. And the toxins then get released into the water and they can pose health risks to people, to pets and to wildlife. And there's a number of health effects that can occur um, either by coming into contact with a cyanobacterial bloom or through consumption of water that contains the toxins. And these symptoms can include things like skin and eye irritation, um, hay fever-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and even more drastic uh, health effects like liver damage. And often uh, the symptoms would be more pronounced in children. The cyanotoxins can be harmful to animals. Unfortunately, every year we do get reports of um, dog deaths or cattle deaths associated with cyanotoxin exposure. And typically the toxins last as long as the bloom, but some toxins can remain in the water at lower levels uh, for some time, depending on local conditions. Um, and in Alberta, one of the most common toxins that we see is microcystin, which is one of the toxins that we monitor routinely. And since the type of cyanobacteria and the amount of toxin present in a bloom can change throughout the season, we treat all blooms as though they're potentially harmful. So according to the Safe Beach Protocol, there's three different situations when water quality is considered unsatisfactory. So you can see the first one on the screen is when we can visually identify a bloom. So if we see a bloom, then that's unsatisfactory water. And the other two instances, so we have microcystin concentration and cyanobacterial cell counts, and those are determined when a water sample is collected and submitted to the lab. So our microcystin level has to exceed 10 micrograms per liter, or our cyanobacterial cell count has to exceed 50,000 cells per milliliter, and those are considered unsatisfactory water quality conditions. So now moving over to enterococcus, which is our um, fecal indicator bacteria that we monitor for. And an indicator bacteria means that generally the enterococcus bacteria themselves do not directly cause illness. Um, but enterococcus is present in human and animal wastes. So if there are high levels of enterococcus in the water, then that means that high levels of more harmful disease-causing microorganisms could be present as well. 
Enterococcus can come from a number of sources. Um, it, anywhere where human and animal wastes are allowed to enter the water, um, plus a few other sources. So uh, at the top, you can see it would be sources like urban runoff, storm drain outlets, treated and untreated sewage effluent, whether that's intentionally or unintentionally released into a water body or near a water body. Um, but we can also have soil, sand, and plant debris that is a source of enterococcus. Um, and then animals, so like agricultural runoff or pets or wildlife can contribute greatly to enterococcus levels in a recreational water body. So the benchmarks for enterococcus are a little bit more complicated. Um, but when a water sample is collected, if the levels are low, so below 1280, and the units there are calibrator cell equivalents per 100 mil, so CCE per 100 mil. So if it's below 1280, that's considered satisfactory and that's great. If the level is above 6,400 CCEs per 100 mil, that's considered quite a bit of uh, contamination. And then we consider that uh, sample unsatisfactory. Now there's this mid-range level, 1280 to 6400, and that's sort of our doubtful range. So what happens if we have a sample with enterococcus levels within that range? The lab does additional testing called microbial source tracking, and they do that to determine if the fecal contamination pardon me, the fecal contamination is from human or ruminant sources. And if it is from human or ruminants, ruminants being animals like cattle, um, then that's a higher risk situation and there's more likelihood of bather illness. And so if we have that positive in that mid range, that's considered unsatisfactory. Whereas if it's negative for human and ruminant sources, it's considered satisfactory. And if you have unsatisfactory water quality, then there's increased chances of illness. Um, if you ingest the water, increased chances of things like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, or in contact, uh, infections like skin, ear, eye, throat infections. Now, when we are picking which beaches are going to sample, we want to make sure that we're using best available resources or make the best use of our available resources. So there's only select beaches that are eligible for routine sampling. And every year, those beaches are chosen. Um, it's largely driven by Alberta Health, who looks at the water quality history and the bather use of beaches all around the province. And they determine which sites are designated as priority sampling beaches. And a priority beach is one that's eligible to submit routine beach water samples through Alberta Health Services and through our lab partners. And if a beach is designated as a priority site, Alberta Health Services uh, will send letters to the beach operator indicating the specific water body name, the beach name, and a unique beach ID number. And then we'll also say you're eligible for either cyanobacteria sampling or you're eligible for enterococcus sampling or perhaps for both. And it's really important to note that all routine sampling is done by beach operators or volunteers. And our sampling season runs the week prior to the May long weekend and it uh, finishes up the week prior to September long weekend so that we capture those uh, typically busy weekends and the entire season in between. And ideally at these priority sites, we would like water samples collected weekly. However, we understand there may be local conditions or logistics that prevent weekly sampling or full season sampling, and that's fine. So here's a brief overview of the process. As I mentioned, Alberta Health determines the priority sites. Um, and then we have Alberta Health Services, namely Environmental Public Health, or the health inspectors, who work with the priority beaches to facilitate sampling. So we'll send out supplies uh, when water samples come back to our offices, we ship those off to the labs, and we follow up on any unsatisfactory results. Um, we also respond to complaints, so that could be somebody notices an issue at a beach at either a priority or non-priority site, and sends that uh, complaint in to us and we'll follow up on that. And then lastly, we have the samplers and these are, the samplers are really 
the eyes, the ears, the hands of the sampling program. Um, so this is our beach operators, which can include Alberta Environment Parks staff, um, municipal staff, campground operators. Um, it includes the alms ne network, including the rec water tech, uh, so Sarah, uh, lake watch techs, the watershed groups and volunteers. And critically, they are the sample collectors, they submit the samples, and whenever there's issues noted during sample collection, um, they alert us to those issues. Now, if unsatisfactory water quality is found, then Alberta Health Services, we may issue an advisory. And if an advisory is issued, the beach operator will be notified and either Alberta Health Services or the beach operator will post a sign. So at the top, you can see an example of uh, an enterococcus or a fecal advisory. And at the bottom, you can see an example of a cyanobacterial bloom advisory. Now there's a couple uh, key differences. So if an advisory is issued for enterococcus, so that fecal indicator bacteria, we post the advisory specifically at that local beach. Um, the results are just at that local site. And if subsequent samples are received and they're satisfactory, then that advisory can be lifted. For cyanobacterial bloom advisories, we post any of the public access points around the water body, so around the lake, for instance. Um, and because we know that cyanobacteria can float and sink in the water column, and they can get blown around depending on wind conditions, uh, we keep that advisory in place for the remainder of the season. However, our messaging does indicate that areas of the lake with no visible bloom can still be used for recreational purposes. And then our cyano advisories are all removed at the end of the season, so towards the end of October. Now we're gonna move into the sampling collection processes, um, but what's really critical here is to ensure your own personal safety when you're collecting samples. So if the weather conditions are poor, you see lightning or there's uh, waves, it, just poor conditions, don't sample. You can sample next week or another day. Um, then we do have in our collection procedures a reference to water safety equipment, including life jackets, hip or chest waders, um, arm length gloves, which are particularly useful if there's a cyanobacterial bloom present that could contain skin irritating compounds, and then access to soap and water, hand sanitizer following the collection of a sample. On our website, so hs.ca, you can see that website here, hs.ca slash EPH business, EPH short for environmental public health. Um, if you go to that website, you'll see a beaches drop down. And under that beaches drop down, you'll see three documents that start with how to collect. And that's the step by step process that Sarah will be reviewing here um, to collect the different samples. And with that, I will pass it over to Sarah. Perfect. Thank you, Janine. Okay, um, so you should be able to see my screen now. Yeah, that looks like the right one. Perfect. All right, so in terms of enterococcus sampling, there are two major types, uh, those being grab sampling and composite sampling. Um, so we will go into depth regarding the grab sampling, seeing as that is definitely the most common and the default type of sampling for enterococcus. Um, if you will be composite sampling, or if you are just curious and would like to know more on how to composite sample, um, I would be happy to provide a more in-depth explanation for that. Uh, like Janine said, our contact information will be at the end of the presentation, so you can email me there, um, or you can feel free to ask your local health inspector as well. Okay, so starting for enterococcus grab sampling, um, there is some preparation that you can do before going out. Um, so for this type of sampling, you'll need three of the ProvLab microbiological bottles as shown in the photo here. Um, and to prep them, you'll need to label them either as one, two, three, or in a different form of labeling scheme that makes sense to you, such as N for North, S for South, M for Mid Beach. 
um, as long as you're consistent and it's very clear how you fill out the requisition form, what belongs with what. Um, and this is great to do as a preparatory step because it's a lot easier to use Sharpie on a dry bottle than it is on a wet bottle. So I would definitely recommend to do this before going out and sampling. So when you're at the site for sampling, um, the Enterococcus protocol has three separate sites. Um, so when you're picking these sites, uh, this is going to be in the area of greatest use by the swimmers. Um, and we want to make sure that these sites are evenly spaced apart um, and that they cover the entirety of the recreation beach zone. Um, so three sites, uh, and you want to make sure you're consistent week to week, most importantly. Um, so to help with this consistency, you can take photos at the beach um, and label them for your reference, or you can use a satellite image and label that, uh, such as the photo at the bottom here. Um, as long as you're consistent week to week and you know which site is which site, then that will be good. And those sites are going to be about hip depth. So at the first site, um, you're going to obviously want clean hands or having nitrile gloves or um, elbow length or shoulder length gloves, especially if there is a cyanobacterial bloom present. Um, so with that in mind, you're going to hold the bottle near the base with one hand and then remove the cap with the other. Uh, it is important to remember to try to avoid touching the inside of the cap or the mouth of the bottle, the inside of the bottle, uh, just throughout the entirety of the process. So to actually fill the bottle, all you're going to do is tip it a little bit to about 45 degrees and submerge it into the water at the first sight. You're going to want to reach about elbow depth or about one foot. Um, and then you're going to rotate the bottle so that the water begins to fill. Um, and then there's a nice 200 mil line indicated on the bottle that's pretty easy to see. So you're going to wait until the water fills up to that line. Um, and then if you go over a little bit, that's totally fine. You can just pour out the excess at the top so that 200 mils is not um, exceeded. So once the water is full to that line, then you're just going to put the cap back on, um, but being careful not to over tighten it um, because that can cause cracks in the lid and then we would be losing the water sample. Um, so here are a couple different examples of samples. Um, so sometimes we see highly colored or really turbid samples. And for the purposes of the analysis at ProvLab, these uh, samples would be inhibited and they wouldn't be able to get results from them. Um, so you can see on the left an example of that where there was no results able to be obtained from those bottles. Uh, but the ones on the right are clear, there's no inhibition, and they were able to get results. Um, so we just ask that you try to avoid the amount of algae in the bottles just wherever possible. So once all three bottles have been filled at the three separate sites, you're going to need to fill out a requisition form for each bottle. So on the requisition form, there's going to be an ID label sticker, um, and then you can peel that off and stick it right onto the bottle. You just want to be careful that you're keeping the requisition forms um, and the bottle straight because there's going to be three of each, and we want to make sure that the requisition form for the site one is, uh, stays with site one, and for site two, it has a rec form for site two, and so on. Um, so in the section called sample details, you're going to be filling out the date, uh, the time of sampling, the water body name, its access number, and your name, the collector's name, and phone number. So this is the uh, access number, water body name, and beach name that I was talking about. Uh, since every recreational beach uh, in Alberta has these three unique identifiers, it is important to use them um, in a complete and unchanged format. So really important that you don't abbreviate the water body name or the beach name on the requisition form. Um, and this information will be available to you on the letter that was sent by AHS. Um, and it can also be obtained by contacting your local health inspector or by us at uh, Alberta Lake Management Society. So the next part of filling out the requisition form, which you can now see on the side here, is the collection site. Um, so that's kind of near the right middle part. And that's where you're going to write either 
your number one, number two, number three, or N or S, and then you're going to add grab sample with whichever um, labeling scheme you've chosen. And then you're also going to add this bright pink sticker to the bottom left of the uh, requisition form in the remarks request section of that, and another bright pink sticker onto the bottle itself. Um, and then once the requisition form is complete, uh, you will put the bottle in a resealable bag with a requisition form on the side pouch. So that's three bottles, three requisition forms, and three bags. And each bottle should have the ID label and the pink label. Um, and I would recommend that the ID label is placed on the bottle after all is said and done with the sampling because it's a paper, it's a paper sticker and it would get wrecked in the water. So once those bottles are settled, you can place them upright in a cooler with ice packs. And then those samples will need to be transported to an environmental public health office immediately. Um, and then for bottle pickup and drop off locations nearest to you, you can go to the AHS website that Janine was just talking about. Um, another way that you can do that is by going to the Alberta Health Services website and searching sample your water. The first hit that comes up there will have all of the same information necessary. So a couple more things to keep in mind with the requisition form is that the samples have to be from a priority beach location. Um, and they need, like I said, both the paper sticker and the pink sticker. And that when you're filling out uh, the water sample type, you are selecting beach, um, not surface water. So as a summary for the requisition form, it's just date and time of collection, the sample details for the location, the collector information, the collection site information, and then beach. So to sum up the whole process, there is some simple preparation you can do uh, with the bottles, then selecting the correct sites, sampling the sites, filling out the requisition form, three forms, three bottles, and then shipping and delivering those sites. And that's it for Enterococcus. In terms of cyanobacteria, it's a little bit different because all of the sampling for cyanobacteria will be done as composite sampling. So this method of sampling combines uh, water from five different sites with two different depth per site. So it totals to 10 separate sites for the one bottle that you'll be filling. So for this type of sampling, all you're going to need is just one of the ACFT microcystin bottles and two of the 50 milliliter uh, conical tubes and just one requisition form as well. So other uh, sampling equipment that you're gonna need for cyanobacteria are a bucket and a wine thief. Um, and the wine thief, which is pictured on the screen here, it allows us to collect water from an entire column within the lake. So when you are using the wine thief to sample, you just wanna make sure that you're using it slowly because it fills from the bottom. So you wanna make sure that when you insert it into the water, it has a chance to actually collect the representative um, column of water. So if you go slowly, you can see it fill. Um, and then once it's full to the top, when you empty it into the pail, you can do so just by dumping it into the pail out of the top of the wine thief or by pressing the bottom against the inside of the pail and then a little plastic bit will move to the side which allows the water to drain. Um, and it does drip a little from that. So you just wanna be careful when you're pouring it into the bucket uh, that you're not losing any water. So for actually sampling for the cyanobacteria, like I said, you're going to have the five separate sites and it's the same thing as it was with Enterococcus where you wanna make sure that those five sites are representative of the entire swimming area and that they are evenly spaced out. Um, so you're, for each five sites, you're going to have, like I said, two separate depths. That's one at about knee depth and then the next at uh, about mid thigh depth. So you're going to go ahead um, and sample using the wine thief um, from each of those sites. So that will total 10 separate samples from the wine thief into the pail. So once those 10 samples are in, you're going to want to swish the water around to make sure that the water is mixed fully. And then using that, you're going to fill up the ACFT bottle 
only three quarters full. Um, and you're going to use the same water to fill up the two orange cap conical 50 mil tubes, um, only to about 48, 49 mils, because you're going to want to leave one mil of space for the Lugol solution. Um, so Lugol's is a type, it's a preservative uh, that contains iodine and potassium iodine, and it is toxic for algae. So this lets us get an accurate representation of the concentration of algae that is present in the water sample at the time of sampling. Um, and given that the uh, Lugol solution has the potential to cause skin irritation, it is definitely best practice to be wearing gloves when you're using it. And this Lugol solution is only going to go into those orange cap 50 mil tubes, not the ACFT microcystin bottle. Um, and again, you're just filling it that one or two extra mils that you left space for to fill the bottles up to 50 mils. And of course, a safety data sheet will be provided with the Lugol solution. So once uh, all three tubes and bottle, uh, bottles are full and the Lugols are added, you can add the caps, again, being careful not to over tighten them to avoid cracking. Um, and then we will be filling out the rec form, just one. Um, so the ACFT requisition form itself has a pack of stickers for each form. Um, and then the stickers are going to be used on both the caps and the tubes of all of the bottles and tubes. So as you can see in the photo, each bottle or tube has the label on both the cap and the body of the bottle. And then with the ACFT microcystin bottle, the white one, once you have those stickers on there, then you can cover the bottle in tin foil to protect it from the sun, just because we don't want um, any of the potential microcystin to be disrupted. Um, so that ACFT sample bottle covered in foil and stickered properly can go in the resealable bag and the rec form that you fill out will go in that bag just with the microcystin bottle. Uh, the other two tubes will go in a separate bag with no requisition form. So all of those samples will be kept in a cooler with ice packs and should be delivered to your local public health office as soon as possible. So here you can see the filled out requisition form for the microcystin analysis. Um, it has a little bit more information than the enterococcus requisition forms just because we're now considering a visual inspection of the water. So the red arrow at the top here shows um, a place for the sticker from that sheet to go on. So the same stickers that went on the bottles and tubes will also go at the top of the requisition form. The other information that will be needed to fill out is uh, the water body name, the beach name, the access number, same as Enterococcus. Um, and now we're also adding in the GPS coordinates and that format is in degree decimal and you're going to want to use six decimal places for that. Uh, the other things to fill out will be collection date and time, the collector's name, phone number, email, and affiliation. And then for, you can check off the water source, so either lake, reservoir, river, et cetera. And since it is cyanobacteria, the type will be composite and treatment will be raw. Uh, the last part of the requisition form for cyanobacteria does require a visual inspection of the water. So this is where taking photos is helpful if you won't be filling this out at the site. Um, and there's a couple other observations that will be mindful to keep in mind when you go, uh, when you go to sample. So things such as the wind direction, the water temperature, uh, and any indication of rainfall in the past 24 hours. So for the visual inspection of the water, one of those items is the turbidity. Essentially the turbidity of the water is just how cloudy it looks. Um, and the cloudiness is caused by the amount of suspended particles in the water. So of course the leftmost beaker here is an example of a clear sample with no turbidity. Um, and then as we go from left to right, you can see how the samples become more turbid. Um, but most importantly, when you're filling out the requisition form, you just want to be consistent week to week with what you're calling clear and what you're calling turbid. As for the color of the sample, 
Um, it's most easily determined just by holding up the tube uh, with the sun in the background so you can see clearly through the tube or by examining the tube against a white background. Um, and the last bit of information you'll need to fill out for the visual inspection of the water is any evidence of a cyanobacterial bloom. So just by looking in the water, you'll see either no evidence, which can co-occur with the water having color to it, um, or particles in the water, or streaks on the water, or scums on the surface of the water. Again, you just want to try to be consistent with uh, what you're calling what week to week. And then, like I mentioned earlier, you also need to fill out the wind direction, the rain in the past 24 hours, and the water temperature. So in summary, for the cyanobacteria sampling, uh, you have your site selection, the sampling from the 10 separate sites, filling out the requisition form, and then shipment and delivery. And that is about all for cyanobacteria sampling and enterococcus sampling. Um, so now I will pass it on to Janine to speak a little bit about the deadlines for the laboratory analysis. All right, thanks, Sarah. Okay, so for all these samples, um, you know, once you go through all the effort of collecting the sample, um, what's important to know is that the different labs have different deadlines for when they will accept the sample. Um, plus, we have, you know, a whole province that is funneling samples into these labs. Um, and so we use couriers to do that. So you need to contact your local public health office, wherever you're dropping your sample off at, um, to verify with them what their specific deadline is. And the phone number that we provide at the end of the presentation, um, that's a phone number that you can call and you can uh, say, hey, I have a beach sample. I'm when can I drop it off? Um, alternatively, if you know your local public health inspector, you can reach out to them and discuss that information with them. All right, next slide, please. Okay, and here's a list of uh, resources on the AHS and ALMS web pages. Um, so as we mentioned, there's that ahs.ca slash EPH business, that first link there. Um, that has under the beach drop down, you'll see a number of resources, including those how to collect uh, documents. Uh, there's linked to a couple of My Health Alberta resources, uh, which talk more about health concerns with water bodies, uh, including cyanobacteria and swimmer's itch. Um, and then if you go to ahs.ca slash BGA, short for blue green algae, um, that is sort of a summary of all of the cyanobacteria information in one place, including a frequently asked questions document that has a lot of information in it. Um, and then if you go to ahs.ca and then under the news drop down, you'll see a few more drop downs, which leads you to active health advisories. And that's where we post all of our recreational water advisories. Um, we haven't had any this year, it's pretty early in the season, but of course they'll be coming. Um, and as they are issued, they're all posted there. And just note that any type of health advisory that Alberta Health Services issues will be posted there as well. So it could be an air quality advisory, it could be a communicable disease advisory as well. So it's sort of your one-stop shop for health advisories. Then on the ALMS web page, uh, under the resources drop down, you'll find a lot of fact sheets on water quality, um, lots of great information there. And then you can also read about um, several of the different ALMS programs, including the Recreational Water Monitoring Program, which Sarah's heading this summer, uh, the Lake Watch Program and the Lake Keepers Program as well. Next slide. And that's it. So uh, you can see on the um, bottom left is the Alberta Health Services contact information. Just draw your attention to uh, the email there is she.recwaters, plural. Um, and then there's that phone number that you can reach out to um, and you can get your local public health office uh, drop off deadlines. Um, you can also ask general questions. You can submit a complaint or concern. Um, that's sort of our, our one stop shop phone number. And then on the right is the ALMS contact information and it's rec.water singular, and then the phone number there as well. Great. 
Okay, yeah, thanks to both of you for running through that, a ton of great information. And we do have a few questions here. I'll maybe throw this one over to Janine. This one came in in the chat actually, and it's asking if you can clarify exactly what we mean by the term beach operator. And if you can also clarify a bit about how priority sites are set. Sure, so when we're saying beach operator, that's basically, whoever has care and control of a given beach. So if it is a campground that's owned by a municipality, um, then it would be, you know, like perhaps the caretaker for that campground um, that would be involved in the collection of the beach water samples. Um, or it, it could be, it, so usually it's a, like a, a local employee of, whatever agency or organization um, quote unquote owns the access to the beach right we know nobody know, owns a beach per se but access to any given beach is controlled by somebody or or something um, and then to clarify a little bit more how priorities are set so i did skim over that but uh, we look at the level of beach use so if a uh, water body or if a, a beach has high bather use then it's included in our consideration whereas if there is virtually no usage at a given beach we have a list of I don't know, several hundred beaches across the province and some of them virtually have no usage whatsoever we're not going to monitor there because we want to get those sites that are used by people. And then the second bit to that is what we know about the water quality at that site. So we have a decent amount of history of water quality samples. Um, so we look at the sample results over the past, um, it, it's growing every year, but 10 plus years. Um, and we look if there were unsatisfactory samples, uh, we look if advisories were issued, and based on that, we set our criteria. Great. Okay. There's another question here that's asking if the samples are dropped off at a community health clinic, do we need to provide a cooler and ice pack to them as well? No. So all the samples, um, I mean, bring your cooler to transport your samples to the health unit, particularly if it's going to be a bit of a drive like some of our beaches have. Um, however, when we ship samples, when Alberta Health Services ships samples, uh, we use our own coolers to, to ship the samples. So you don't have to leave a cooler. Great. And there's a question here that maybe I can take a stab at. It says, are there regulations to prevent livestock from entering lake water? If yes, what is the process? Who to contact if witnessed? And I'm not aware of any broad policies in the province that restrict cattle from entering lakes. It is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis if the cattle are accessing the lake through an environmental reserve area that's maybe owned by the county, then in that case, there may be an issue. So I think it's very case by case and probably connecting with your county to determine if that's private landowner area or if it's through an environmental reserve area would be your best bet. And the county may have resources to engage with those producers in terms of developing an environmental farm plan, or even putting in an off-watering site for those cattle. So that might be the best place to start for that. And I also see that Neil in the uh, participants has his hand up. I'm going to choose to allow you to talk, Neil, if you do have a question. And if not, no worries. Or you can type it in the chat for the Q&A. Okay, maybe it was just a mistake. Okay, are there any other questions? Oh, um, 
there is a question that says, please clarify the difference between sample collector versus beach operator. Yeah, so that's a good question too. Um, it's it, There's really not much dif difference. They could both be samplers, right? Um, the beach operator we use more as sort of I indicated before, somebody who has care and control of a, a beach. Um, whereas a sampler or sample collector could really be anybody, including volunteer, um, who has not, no affiliation with a, a given beach. Um, so there's really no difference. Um, usually what happens, we, we being Alberta Health Services, send out those letters to the beach operator and give the beach operator the first crack at saying, yes, I'll collect samples from my local beach. Um, and if that beach operator is unable to collect samples for whatever reason, um, that's where we work closely with ALMS to uh, try and locate an alternate sampler. So that could be Sarah herself collecting a sample. Um, it could be a volunteer through a watershed that Sarah or Brad finds. Um, and really, it doesn't matter who collects the sample. The information is used to assess the quality of water at a given beach um, to determine whether uh, at that time it was satisfactory or not satisfactory. Great, thanks. And we also have a question, or Pauline has raised her hand. Let me see if I can allow Pauline to speak here. 